Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Welcome to Target One. If you are visiting this morning, it's good to have you. May we stand and we'll begin our service this morning. say hello to our honeymooners who are back touring I really appreciate that and also Jerrica if you'll stand up for a second uh, <laughs> yeah. Jerrica doesn't get to be with us a lot but she works uh, for a college down in Virginia and only gets very little time off but this is the last time you will see our daughter Jerrica as a single woman she's been married in two weeks and yes, you're right. We had we had two weddings in six weeks here. So uh, so uh, please let Jerrica know that uh, get a chance to talk to her after church a little bit and uh, and be in prayer for her and her uh, and Andrew, who is her fiance, and they will be married August 10th. So we will be down uh, and involved in that. So we are glad you're here. It's good to see you folks today. A lot of prayer requests, and I'm really going to ask you this week to uh, to to go the extra mile for some folks. Uh, be in prayer for uh, for Doug Heilman. Be an encouragement for Doug. If you feel comfortable, reach out to Doug a little bit. Uh, had, had an episode yesterday. Uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, but blood pressure really dropped really low. Um, Doug took a, took a fall also. Um, but if, you, if, if you're comfortable, please reach out to Doug. If you happen to be over toward Claysburg, or you live, live over that way, don't be afraid to stop by and see him. I'm sure he'd appreciate that. Also, Jolene. Uh, you know, had a fall and had some rough times over the weekend. Thank you for all those ladies who, and, and men who I know are going out of their way to help Jolene and try to minister to her. And, um, and I would guess if, if you're interested in trying to help Jolene a little bit more in, in any way you could, I know Seth isn't here today, they're, they're battling some help. But maybe you could see Tammy, uh, maybe see, see Tammy if, if you could and let Tammy know that. 
you know, that, hey, I'll, I'm, I'm willing to, to help there if I can do it. Greg Russell is home. Am I right, Tim? He looked really good. We were in to see him Thursday night. And if you know anything about Greg, Greg, first of all, is always smiling. Always, uh, always, um, you know, that way. And he looked at us and he said, man, I had a really long surgery. He said it was, what, three hours? What was that? Four. And then Tom Wink said, well, I had a longer surgery. Mine was 48 hours. So, you know, we, we know that. You know, Tom said, no, no. And he said his double bypass was, was, was small, small potatoes to Tom's uh, quadruple bypass. But I'll tell you what. The Lord is really working well, and Greg was just up and moving, and we're praising the Lord for, for Greg. Uh, so if you get a chance, reach out to Greg and Trish also. And uh, Wayne, we're glad you're with us today. Good to see Wayne. Uh, uh, we're, we're praising the Lord there. Be in prayer also for Russ Stacy. Russ has a lot going on. I know he told me two weeks ago he might be iffy making it to church now and then because he's battling some health. We, we have a lot going on in our congregation. Andrea is, um, is, is grieving with the loss of her brother, if you did not know that. Uh, she lost her uh, only brother uh, last weekend. Uh, they found him uh, that he had passed. And that's tough on Andrea. And I know it's a lot on Adam trying to deal with his wife. Uh, so, so please uh, be, be with, uh, you know, in, in prayer there for Andrea and Adam. Uh, we're, we're screaming. And Joe, we're just so proud to see you. But it's, it's not so hard to see you in the family here. And just continue to be in prayer for Joe. Because... I know, we know where Alice is, and she's healed, and she's, she's walked with the Lord, but it's physically tough. So, um, we have a lot to be in prayer for. Baptism, if you want to be baptized, please come and see me and let me know. We're trying to finalize those plans. Kind of depends on how many folks we have being baptized, where we might go. I know there's some issues going on at Chapman Run right now, but if you're someone who wants to be baptized, says, you know, I really need to be baptized, or I want to be re-baptized. Maybe I've kind of drifted away. But I want to associate with this church family and let people know I want to be rebaptized. Please come and see me, and we will do that. All right, I think that's all the announcements I had. Um, Mike, you don't look much different since you crossed over the threshold there. I do want to let you know that. I do want to put a shout out to Nate. Uh, uh, I don't know if you guys know it, but Tom has one of our shirts on, and we have the, the green shirts on that say, All Things Are Created by God. Nate was wearing his down in Virginia. Because, um, honey, do not take this this way, because I don't mean it this way. <laughs> Jenny took Mike, like, to, what, drove to three states so he could go to his best favorite restaurant. I'm not saying we have to do that. <laughs> I want to make, make sure you understood that. I want to make sure you understood that. But there was Nate uh, wearing his Target yeah. One Target one shirt that said, all, uh, all things are created by God, Genesis 1, 24 and 26. And Mike and Jenny both told me he had so many people went out of their way to say something to him about that. So thank you, Nate, for being a testimony. But see, that's getting the message out. That's a conversation starter. And that's why we put that on our shirt. Because we want to start conversations. We want people to say, well, all things. You mean dinosaurs? Yeah. And get educated on that. If you say, well, I'm not sure about the dinosaurs, go back and see some of our previous messages. Two years ago, I think it was, we did a whole series on, on creation on dinosaurs, but that starts talk, talking to that, just discussions. And it's usually not friendly discussions because someone will come up to you and say that. So that is awesome. So we are really proud of that. All right, let's, uh, let's go to prayer if we could. Lord, I thank you for um, the fact that we are all gathered here today. I think of our, uh, our military men who are overseas or who are serving in our, our, uh, our armed forces. I think of Diane's grandson. We just pray that you'll be with him as he's the United States Marine Corps. And just keep your hand upon him. I, I, I think of the Houston son as he's in the Navy. Uh, just be with him. And Lord, uh, we know um, Michelle and Sean are down visiting uh, you know, their, their son who's in the Air Force. Lord, I thank you for these men. I think of Ethan Welch who uh, came up to, to, to a wedding the other day and I talked to Ethan about uh, you know, what's going on in the military, spiritual-wise. So, Lord, we want to be lifting our men and women up who are in the service and praying for God to work. It's, it's a tough time in our, in our nation, in our world, to start out the Olympics. We see it's kind of an anti-God shift that's going on. Help us, Lord, to be believers who are not afraid to stand up and hold to what 1 Peter 3, 15 say. Be prepared to give an answer. And some of them ask you, about the faith and the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, these prayer requests, uh, we just pray you will be with each of these folks. I pray for Andrea, who I know is grieving, I know is hurting right now. We just pray that 
you will comfort her and give them a safe trip as they travel back to Pittsburgh today. And I think of Joe, and I thank you for his testimony. Um, with Alice, and we thank you for Alice's life and continue to be with Joe um, and, and, and help him through these tough times. We think of Joe Reed, who's battling health right now and wants to be with us and going through some things and trying to figure out some, uh, some living uh, conditions and who can help her a little bit. So, Lord, we just lift our sister up right now and, and thank you for her. We, we pray for our brother, Doug, uh, who, man, he wants to be with us. I called him, talked to him last night. And, and uh, even Nancy told me he's in the hospital, but not by his own will. And he even said that. He said, man, I don't want to be here. But uh, be with Doug this morning and give him a special blessing and help, help the doctors to figure out exactly why his blood pressure keeps tanking uh, and why he keeps falling. Lord, I thank you for the praise that we have, that uh, for, for Wayne David would be with us. Uh, Greg, you, you carried him through that medical well, uh, surgery this week. And, man, he's up and moving around. And we pray for our brother Russ. And you'll let the doctors know exactly what's going on with Russ. And Father, if I miss someone else who, who maybe is, uh, is, is a praise or going through something, we just pray for them. Lord, we love you. You're good all the time. Even though sometimes we forget that. Even though sometimes we look the other way. Even sometimes we get tripped up and oh, we grumble a little bit. You are good all the time. You are fair. You are just. And you ask us to seek you first. The kingdom of God. And we do that all the righteousness will be added unto I thank you so much, Lord. And we just pray this in the great risen name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Shall we stand and we'll continue to, to sing to our Lord and Savior this morning?
morning, everybody. Um, so I just kind of thought of this as Pastor Phil was praying here. But um, you've seen the, the opening to the Olympics and that blasphemous uh, thing that occurred with them mocking the Last Supper. Uh, instead of, well, it would kind of anger us a little bit, I want to challenge you guys to use it as a springboard to preach the gospel. So I asked him, you know, what, what did you think of that? Don't you think that's a little disrespectful of the Christian community? Uh, don't you think we should be respectful towards one another's beliefs? What do you think? Do you believe in God? Then you can walk through the Ten Commandments with them. You can um, walk through the uh, substitutional atonement that Jesus Christ did on the cross. So as you're going out uh, this week to work, to the grocery store, whatever, if you're talking to somebody, I challenge you to talk to somebody about that. What do you think? Um, but anyways, we're here for uh, the offering, if the ushers would come up. Um, uh, this offering is just to kind of keep this place running. It's to uh, keep spreading the gospel and help us do that. Um, so let's bow our heads in prayer. Uh, Lord, we just want to thank you for this wonderful day that we're able to come here and worship you. Um, that we're able to sin, sit under a, uh, an honorable pastor who wants to teach us the word, Lord. We, uh, we pray that you use him today. Please bless the gift of the giver um, and help us to proclaim your gospel to the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
And Ray, I think, has invested a lot in you, and they care about you, and I know these guys are personal friends and, and good elders of the church. And I thought it just kind of blessed you as, as these men, kind of with me, you know, pray over you. Uh, pray you and Andrew, who's your future husband, fiance, who you've got work, um, and your marriage coming up. So if you want to stand here, and, uh, and Ray, and Ron and I will just kind of put hands on you, on your shoulder, there we go, and just, uh, just be in prayer for you for a blessed marriage and a marriage of honor to God. Precious Heavenly Father, we want to lift Jerry and Andrew up to you, Lord, and they walk through life, Lord, that they always look to you for their guidance, Lord, and help us as they go through life, Lord, that uh, they are safe and and uh, they they always worship you, Lord, and help us as we all walk through life, Lord. We always look to you, Lord. Forgive us where we fail, Lord, but I'll pray for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Dear Heavenly Father, it's just a, it's a great honor and privilege to be able to lift Jerry up to you. Amen. Uh, she's just been a, a blessing in my life since she was very little. I just want to thank you so much for this joyous occasion. It's just such a wonderful thing that we're seeing these people in our church or this, uh, affiliated with our church in any ways to get married and, and, and join with another and, and uh, under under you, Lord. And I just praise you that they can uh, have a marriage that will honor you as well as with each other. just want to thank you so much, Lord, for all the blessings that uh, – that these two have had on, on their families, even Jerry, especially on our church family. Just be with her. Uh, I, I ask you to, to put a special blessing on everything that they do and everything that they say to each other, that they would always put you first because when anything comes up that might be even a little negative, if they have you in the middle, it just cannot fail. Amen. So we lift that up to you and praise you for this uh, adjoining of two people as we did here just a couple weeks ago for our sister. We praise you for it all. Well, I just echo the prayers of my brothers here. We just uh, thank you for Jerick. I thank you that she knows you as her Lord and Savior. I just thank you for that fact. I thank you for Andrew, that he knows you as his Lord and Savior. And Lord, uh, opening the door and bringing these two folks together. Uh, we just pray um, a, a, a First Corinthians 13 marriage upon them, a, a love on them. Like you tell us to love each other, that we're not envy, it's not proud, it's patient, it's understanding, it's kind, it's forgiving. Uh, Lord, we pray that. We pray Ephesians 5 upon them, that, that, that boy, that um, Andrew just be the spiritual leader of that home, and that he will love Jared uh, the way he loved the church. I, I just pray, Lord, uh, um, the, the Proverbs 31 woman over Jericho, that she would just be a woman who honors you and wants to, uh, to, to bring Christ to her children and faith to her children. So, Lord, we thank you for their, um, for their couple. We thank you for Jericho right now as we send her off to Virginia, and we just pray let her know that this church family's behind her. Uh, where we we're going to be lifting her and Andrew up in prayer, as we are with all of our, our newlyweds and all of our married folks. We should be because boy, prayer is needed in marriage. Prayer is so needed as a fundamental building block of marriage. So Lord, we thank you so much. We just uh, um, pray now, uh, peace, and blessing upon Jericho and Andrew as they move forward in the marriage that will honor you raise uh, children that will honor you, and they will be known as a blessing to those who come into them because they love the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus' name we pray and thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 And again, that was Alf's teleprompter, so Jerrica didn't know that was coming, and uh, neither did Ray or Ron. Um, it's one of those things you just get a chance to, uh, to be able to do. So children, you're dismissed to head back. Hey, and I'll tell you what, those of you who are going back to, um, to is that the blue room you're in, Mindy? Well, that really sounds fun. Mindy has bamboo for these kids to work with today. And, uh, man, I'm excited. I, 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 in fact, I'm thinking maybe Ron will come up and speak, and I can go back there and uh, see, what that, uh, see what's going on if I could. So I'm going to encourage you to take out, your, uh, take out your notes, if you would, and follow along, because um, you know, we're talking about mysteries of the kingdom. Now, there was a film that came out around 2000, I believe it was, somewhere in that area, maybe 1998, might have been a little older when I realized. Uh, remember the Titans. I'm a big Denzel Washington fan. I like Denzel Washington. I think he's a great actor. I, um, I, I like his faith statements that he makes. He's you know, very conservative on, on many of his positions. So I like watching him. I think he's a very talented actor. And remember the Titans. It's based on a true story about a uh, Virginia high school in the early 1900s, 
1960s in which they had a white coach. Coach Yost was his name. Well liked by the community, good coach. But all of a sudden now Coach Boone came in, who's in uh, Enzo, Washington. Because now it's an integrated football team. Now they're bringing, bringing black players in to, 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 to mix with the white players and have an integrated team. It didn't go well in Virginia at this time. In fact, it didn't go well at all because Coach Yost had to step down as the head coach to become the defensive coordinator, which really was you know, kind of a demotion to him. And what they found out happened was when they went into their first couple games, the officials were against Coach Boone. So they started throwing flags all over the place against the Titans because they were, they were cheating. The officials were literally cheating to make Coach Boone look bad so he would lose his job. And, um, and it wasn't fair at all that was going on. Why do I bring that up? Because sometimes as believers, we say, is God cheating against me? Why, why is it that such and such over here is getting all kind of blessing and I'm not? Is God not fair? Is it kind of like remember the Titans? So we're going to step into that today because we're going to look into a parable that addresses this 100%. But I want to start out by, by putting a foundation down. I'm using two verses out of Psalms. God is fair. His righteousness and justice. Justice and fairness, you will see throughout the Hebrew language, is, is kind of inter, inter, intertwined at times. Uh, so they'll use the word fairness or justice. Because if I'm just, I'm fair. That means you know I'm, I'm, I'm 100%. You know, I treat someone the same all the time. Uh, the, the foundations of God's throne. The strength of the king loves justice. You have executed justice. God is fair. He is fair all the time. Now, the problem is life isn't fair. Some of us have a nice big bowl to swim in. Some of us don't. Some of us have outgrown our bowl. Who knows? Why isn't life fair? Because it's tainted by sin. That's a fact, a fundamental fact that if we are mature believers, we have to understand. God didn't say, well, you know, I'm going to send Alzheimer's to this person. Boy, I'm sending cancer to this person. And man, this person here, man, I'll tell you what, this is, oh, I'm just going to, no. No. See, our world has fallen because of sin. And if you truly believe in a God who creates, and he created a perfect world, there was no death, there was no sin, because day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six of creation. And day six is the day he created man, by the way. And mammals, air-breathing animals, and, and, and mankind. We were created in God's image. Guess what it says? And at the end of the day, God says, and it was good. Man was created good. The animals were good. The world was good. Man, the, the lion and the lamb, they were, they, were, they were bouncing around with each other. The big dinosaurs, they were all hanging out with each other, giving high fives, going to tennis, soccer games or whatever. They weren't eating each other and running around after each other like velociraptors and stuff like that. The ground was good. There were no thorns. There, there was no, no illness, no sickness. But when death came or sin came into the world because man said, no, oh, no, 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 no. God, I think it really looks a lot better on the other side. And man was deceived by God. I'm sorry, man was deceived by the enemy in Genesis chapter 3. Now despair comes in. Genesis 3 says God had to look at his creation and do what? He cursed it. He cursed the ground. Cursed be the ground and cursed be the earth. Thorns and thistles. Now we have poisonous plants. Now we have now the, the venom that certain snakes had now becomes poisonous. Now animal will turn against the animal. Man will turn against man. There will be all kind of death and sin. And we live in a cursed world. Disease and sin-driven effects are going to cause things not to be fair. Some people are going to die early because of something in the system, something that's inherited in the system, passed on through genetics by mom and dad, and maybe they don't make it past 20. Some people are going to have cancer, and they're going to battle it at age 40. Some people might live up, up to age 80 or 90, and then man, they, they'll, they'll pass peacefully in their sleep, while others will see Alzheimer's hit at age 50 or something like that. And people say, man, God, how can you not be fair? 
God is fair. It's fundamental to understand that. And that's kind of what this parable addresses a little bit. But we're going to talk about, is God fair? And it's one of those messages that are kind of tough to hit because, boy, we like to see fairness on our scale. I know I do. I have a lot of trouble with that. And I, I, I'm, I'm, this message is really, really for me because there's times that, that um, maybe I work with people who I know they don't serve God. And I know they're not even interested in God at all. But man, I see them just have this and this and this. And they have this and they talk about going here and going there. And, and this goes on. Or, or I see someone else who maybe they'll claim they're a believer, but they're not active. And they're not growing. They're not really investing any talent anywhere for the Lord. And man, I see them just racking up things over there left and right and left and right. And sometimes I say, God, are you fair? Are you fair that I'm battling this and someone else is battling that? So it's important for us to realize, one, God is fair. And why do we sometimes think God isn't fair? And I think that's why he gave us this parable in Matthew chapter 20. Remember, we're going back to all these parables, and then we're, we're laying the uh, foundation and the establishment of what a parable is. It means to throw alongside in comparison. So when Jesus taught in parables, He's basically uh, giving, a, giving a, an earthly picture of what is a heavenly message. And he's tossing it side by side. We talked about the soil the, uh, for a good bit a couple weeks ago. We talked about that. We talked about building upon the rock compared to building on the sand. Now we're talking about workers in a vineyard. So a parable, again, earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. And yes, Jesus taught in those. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. So I'm in Matthew chapter 20, and we're, go, we're not going to read the whole thing. You can read it when you get home. I'm going to read some select verses of it. But if you really want to go deeper into the, into the message, uh, take your notes and kind of follow along just as a devotion if you want to later today. Kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. And by the way, this kingdom of heaven, don't get thrown off by that. Some will use, some of the gospel writers will say kingdom of heaven. Others will say kingdom of God. It's really the same thing. So Matthew likes to say kingdom of heaven because he's writing to a more Jewish-based crowd, uh, where Luke is going to say kingdom of God because he's writing to a little more, more Gentile somewhere. So when you see kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, don't think, oh, is there, is there some type of mystery between whether heaven or, 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 or God is used? No, there's not. No, there, there is not. Uh, different writers will use different terminology at times. They're all inspired by God. That's important to remember. So every word of the Bible is God's word. So you have a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for the vineyard, his vineyard. Now, that was that happened in, uh, at that time in Israel. You had the vineyards, when the vineyards were ready to be, to be harvested. Now, at this time, you have this massive vineyard, and you, you, know, you have all these grapes on there, and then they have to be pulled off at a certain time. So if, I'm, if I own the vineyard, I don't have a large employee pool. You know, I don't have 3,000 employees somewhere. Uh, what I do, I go out or it, at times and they say, hey, I'm going to be hiring guys to work in my vineyard. Who wants to hire? Be hanging out at a certain place, and I'll hire you. So I went out, or the, 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 uh, the, the vineyard owner went out, and he went into town, and he saw a bunch of guys hanging out early in the morning, and he said, you know what? I need laborers for my vineyard. So we have this parable, the, la the landowner is God. No question about it. The landowner is God himself. The laborers are us. So instead of, uh, instead of trying to figure out, well, could, is the landowner's name Benjamin or is it Yakud? No, it's our name. Throw your name in there somewhere. So we're kind of the landowner. Or, I'm sorry, the laborers. Maybe the la laborers represent us. Now, I want you to keep this in mind. And I have the life game board up here. We've all probably played the game of life. I used to love to play life back as kids. You had a little car, you know, and a little person. You decide which path to go down. If you get married, they put the pink person in there with you, and you're blue, and you're driving your little car, and you go here and there, whatever, and then somebody spins. All right, it's fun. What does Jesus Christ, what does God Almighty, what's the Holy Spirit tell us we should live our life like? Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Oh, that sounds pretty easy. What's the gospel of Christ? Now, that's a good question. So does that mean I need to know the gospel of Christ means the character of Christ? So whatever we do in life, and this is tough, 
Carry yourself the way Christ would. What would God do in this situation? Would God forgive? Sometimes we need to forgive. Sometimes we've been crushed by people. They've done us wrong. We're called to forgive. We need to give grace. Maybe somebody doesn't deserve forgiveness. I know that. I, believe me. I, I've been hurt by people in my life, and I say, man, they don't deserve forgiveness. God gives grace to those who don't deserve it. That's what grace is. Forgiveness given to people who don't deserve it. We should love. We should be in prayer. We should be sharing the gospel. Whoa, okay. So this parable does deal with God's fairness, yes. But it goes a little deeper because it also warns us about our attitude in serving him. So this parable has two very specific applications. One is it's telling us God's fair. And there's different places where that is pointed out. But it's also looking at us, the laborers, and saying, what's your attitude toward work? What's your attitude toward the vineyard owner who's God? Do I have a happy-go-lucky attitude to man? I am just glad to be in the kingdom and be working. <laughs> or do I have a grumbling, oh, man, this, this job stinks. Oh, man, I'm not getting treated the way I should be treated. I, I'm getting screwed over, and I know that guy, he doesn't do anything. And boy, he's getting rewarded. <laughs> I've had that attitude at work before. Not against you, Eric. I believe you're a very good worker, and you deserve to get what you're getting. So, so that's, that's not toward you either, Adam. Not that, uh, I don't know if you that thing up, must be toward me. It's on you either, Ed. So, but, but I've had that attitude before. We've all had that attitude, haven't we? You know, we all get that attitude towards someone. So let's talk about things a little bit. So it's 1867, and the Russians own this huge piece of land that uh, there's a bunch of ice on it and a bunch of non-friendly people called Eskimos, it's called Alaska. And all of a sudden, Russia's going through a real tough time. They, uh, they, they fought a big war with Napoleon in about 1815. They fought a war with the English in 1848 uh, called the uh, Crimean War. They're going through a lot of changes in Russia. The new czar, the guy by the name of Alexander II, he's trying to put a lot of social changes into Russia. They need some money. And all of a sudden, Alexander II says, you know what, well, we're holding this big piece of ground over here. Uh, called Alaska, maybe we ought to sell it to the Canadians. Well, the Canadians don't want to buy it, but all of a sudden the United States says we do. So we went up there, we started negotiating with them a little bit, and we ended up buying Alaska for about $7 million. It's a great deal. It's like 2.2 .2 cents an acre. I mean, a tremendous deal. Now, there was, they didn't know there was oil in Alaska. They didn't know there was gold in Alaska. And all of a sudden, about 1900, we say, hey, look, we found gold. Oh, and the Russians are jacked. Hey, look, we found oil. Oh, and the Russians are jacked again. And they say, man, we got screwed over. You mean you sold that ground for 2.2 .2 cents an acre? Oh, yeah. oh. Hey, they didn't do a good bargain. They should have done their research and saw what was on Alaska instead of just passing it over to us. So warning number one as we read this parable. Beware of bargaining with God. How many of us have ever bargained with God? Boy, God, if you answer this prayer right now, oh, man, am I, I'm changing my life, baby. I am changing my life. Oh, I'm looking at the neighbors. Oh, I heard that lottery, and then that lottery, it just went in, what, oh, $250,000. Oh, God, 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 God. If I win this lottery, I'm going to tithe 20%. <laughs> 30, how's that? 35, you got it. Oh, man. And I'm going to tell everybody how good you are to me. If you do that all, oh, we all try to bargain with God, don't we? Because, see, we don't think God's fair. So we have to push him a little bit somewhere. Because we need to make sure he knows that we want something. Again, fairness is a sliding scale according to how we see it. I see things that are fair that come down in my favor. If it doesn't come down in my favor, it's not fair. Right? I'm probably not the only one. I, I, I'll raise my hand, but I'm probably not the only one who sees things that way. So, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them out in the vineyard. So he goes to these laborers, and he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. How about I give you guys a denarius for a whole day's work? Whoa, a denarius? Really? That's what a Roman soldier makes for a day. That's pretty good salary. 
Wow, okay. Yeah, we're as happy as can be. So how about I offer you this? How about I offer you the gift of my son, Jesus Christ? And uh, he will die upon a cross. And if you realize that, and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, that sin debt that you owe me is paid. It's forgiven. And now you will enter into my kingdom. You will live an abundant life while you're here on earth. And when you die, you will enter into my kingdom of eternal life. All I ask for you is to work for me. Oh, man, I love Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. This is pretty nice. We're getting a full Daenerys for our day's work. Man, we're as happy as peaches or pears or apples, whatever fruit you want to use. We're as happy as whatever it is. Now, and then he went out and hired more workers. Nobody says no more workers. And so he went back into the marketplace, and he goes in there about the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, the eleventh hour. He goes back in four times, and he, he needs more workers because the harvest, there's a ton of grapes that need harvested. And I, I, I need more and more people. Hey, I tell you what, I need workers for my vineyard, and I will, I will pay you what is right. I will give you what is right. Yeah, sure. More workers come in. More workers come in. More workers come in. More workers come in. Oh, they're all going to get paid in the nest. It's easy to feel that we got ripped off. Eventually, those workers who got hired at 5.30 in the morning are going to start to say, hey, that guy who only worked an hour, he got paid the same as I did. Just shoot me over. Right? And that, that's the attitude you have to look at. That's the attitude of the laborers. Hey, that guy who just accepted Christ at the last moment before he died, are you serious? He gets the same blessings that I got and I've lived for Christ for 60 years? Wow. See, now you start to see how that, that this parable is really written toward us. And... Are you serious? That, that, that guy over here, he's already done anything for the kingdom. I've done all this work for the kingdom. I've, I've, I've borne the brunt of the work. I've been there. I, I, I've had people make fun of me. I've, had, I've lost friendships over this. I, I've done this, and I've done that, and I've done this. And you're, you're telling me that that guy who, who at the 11th hour made the decision for Christ, that thief on the cross, Oh, you're really we're the disciples, and we, we followed Jesus for three years. We we were there when he baptized. We were there when we were getting chased out of places or doing this. And you're telling me that thief on the cross, who all of a sudden in, in five minutes looked at Jesus and said, You are the one true Son of God. And Jesus looked at him and said, Today, today you will be with me in paradise. He gets the same reward I did. You serious? I'm Peter. I'm going to be crucified upside down. I'm Paul. I'm going to write 14 Gospels. I'm going to be beheaded in front of thousands and my head kicked around like a soccer ball. This guy gets the same as I do? Now it hits, doesn't it? Now, this is what Jesus is telling us. We, we have to look where our attitude is. See, we can trust God implicitly. And I know there's some of you in here who've been hurt. Man, you've been crushed by somebody. Maybe it was a prior relationship and somebody crushed you. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe you came up from a bad home. You know, maybe, maybe mom and dad really weren't much. Mom and dad, maybe you kind of raised yourself. Maybe you went through some really tough stuff. Maybe you went through tough stuff in the military. Maybe you went through tough stuff and because of, of, of who knows what. But if you can trust God with all your heart, see, that's what Proverbs says. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says that you can't just trust God a little. You can trust him with all your heart, no matter what. You just know he's going to do what's right. I've had people say to me, and, and they, like to, they like to trip you up. They love to trip people up. Well, so, so, Pastor, tell me about what happens to the baby who is right ready to be born, and all of a sudden they're aborted in the ninth month. You know, there was this thing called the, um, uh, there's this thing called the um, Born Alive Act, by the way. And I won't say who it was, but one of the people running for president right now voted against that act, by the way, in 2000 uh, when they were in the Senate. And that act said that if you, were, if you survived a botched abortion, you were not allowed medical, you were supposed to get medical treatment. It's called the Born Alive Act. But they shot it down and said, no, if you survive a botched abortion, you lay there and die. 
horrible thing, horrible thing. And they'll say, well, Pastor, what about a baby who died who was maybe aborted in the ninth month? Or what about a child who died when they were five? Or what about when the rapture occurs and my three-year-old is left here? And what I tell them is, you know, I can't answer that, but I do know what. God is just and God is good, and he will always do what's right. He will always do what's right. You know, because we have to trust his grace and his forgiveness, and he's God Almighty. So will God Almighty do what is fair and just and right? Yes, he will. How do we know that? Because we can trust him with all our heart. Because when we lean on him, he will make our way straight. You just have to know that he's a good God. And there's there question, some questions that, 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 that you're just not going to get answered where you have to understand the default is God is good. Day one, two, three, four, five, six, everything he created was good. God is good. God loves us so much he demonstrated that love for us while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. God is good. He will do what is right. When the rapture occurs, he will do what is right. A child who dies before they, uh, they're, uh, they're what's called that age of accountability, or maybe the child who, who is born and they're just not able to make that decision, and that happens at times, God will do what is right. And I trust my God because he's a good God. Amen. And he's good all the time. So let's not get worried about, about that. Let's just say, I'm going to trust God all the time because he will do what is right. And that is God. See, God will never shortchange you. How do we know that? Pastor, show me why, how God will never shortchange you. The cross of Jesus Christ. The cross is the proof right there that he will never shortchange you. He, he sent himself. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus Christ. He's part of himself to die upon the cross. And, and I, I've used this example before. I have one, you know, I have one son. I now have a, a son-in-law. Um, but I'm not going to send either of those guys to, to, to die for someone. Man, I, I just love him that much, right? I mean, you guys who have sons and you have children, could you just send someone, your son, to die for someone? Especially if they don't even accept you, they don't even like you, they, 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 they despise you. But that's God. He did not spare his own son, delivered him for us. How will he not also give us all things freely? God's good. Hold to that idea. God is good, and he's a generous God. I like what Jesus said here in Matthew 7. So if you want to read this, this trip me up sometime. Or what man is among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, gives him a stone? Now, he's talking here. He, he's not always talking about believers. He's even talking about people who don't believe. Okay, my son comes to me. He wants a loaf of bread. I'm going I'm to give him a loaf of bread. I'll, I'm, I'm not going to give him a stone. I'm not going to watch him suffer. Or if he asks for a fish, I'll give him a steak. Yeah, can I have something to eat? Yeah, sure. I'll just rattlesnake. You know, you know I'm not, no. What kind of dad is that? I'm not going to do that for him. If you then, being evil, those of you who don't even know me or don't even like me, you declare whatever against me, how much more will your father know how to give gifts to your children? How much more will your father in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? So what that means is, God says, trust me. Trust me. I'm good. Don't worry. I, I, know, I know you're in peril about what's going to happen to this, to this, to this. What's going to happen to, to, to my children if the rapture occurs? What's going to happen to my children who maybe right now, they, maybe they, they can't make a decision? What's going to happen to this? To... Now, I, I will say this, though. You have to realize this. Those folks who have had the opportunity to make a decision, it's a different story different story. So don't say you can apply this to someone now who is 60 to 70 years of age and can't make a decision anymore. For 40 years they had the opportunity to make a decision for Christ and they failed to do it. But we're talking now about you know, is God fair to those who maybe haven't had the opportunity? And that's a, it, 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 it's a whole different discussion by the way when you talk about well, those who have not quote heard the gospel. That's a whole different discussion where and we'll talk about that. I've already addressed that in the message. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But I'm talking about that person who, who couldn't. So I can be trusted. Numbers tells us that. Romans 8, 28 tells us that. Jesus says that he cried out to God, Abba, Father. <laughs> father, Dad. I'm really what the word is. Loving Father. I can remember when I was a kid. I remember when I was a kid. Um, uh, things would happen. My dad would always be right there in his arms open. 
And I knew when I jumped up into my dad's arms, man, he, he would give me a hug. And those callous hands he had working all day. But I knew I was safe. I, I knew nothing could touch me when I was in my dad's arms. And, right? I, and then you, you guys who are fathers, you know that. When your sons and daughters were little, all of a sudden they come up to you, nothing's going to touch them because you're wrapping your whole body around them. You're protecting them no, no matter what. That's what God is like here. I have a picture of, a, of an anchor chain. This is a chain that we used um, during the Revolutionary War. We put a chain across the Hudson River. We had a number of forts in the place where West Point is today. But we had a number of forts because the Hudson River came up and took a bend. And then it went on up to Albany. Uh, went from Albany down to New York City. But right at that bend, we took this giant chain and uh, put across the water to catch British ships. And this chain was impregnable. I mean, you could not, you could not break this chain. In fact, they still show where it's anchored into these rocks uh, there. That's how God is. He's an unbreakable chain for us. God gives great gifts to his children, right? No matter how bad you've been hurt, you can trust in God that he will heal you. No matter how bad you've been crushed, no matter how bad your addiction was, no matter how uh, horrible you thought of yourself, no matter how bad someone used you, no matter how bad they crushed your spirit, they crushed your soul, Christ says, when you come to me, and you come humbly to me, I will restore you. I am like this chain. And when you jump into my arms, it's unbreakable, the bond I have with you. No one will tear you out of my hand. Wow, that's a good God. That is a really good God. But sometimes we get like Roddy Roddy Piper. I have to put this slide in, because now I know Dan Hoover's a big pro wrestling fan, and he loves Roddy Roddy Piper. So now and then i got to put this slide in, just so Dan pays attention. But anyhow, you know, Roddy Roddy Piper, if you ever watched professional wrestling back in the 80s, what's in it? He's always, what's in it for me? What's in it? You know, he's always going, what's in it for me? Well, what, what's in, and that's how we are at times. What's in it for me? You know, God, I'm not going to go out and serve you until you do this. God, I'm not serving you until you give me these spiritual gifts. You know, I've, I've dealt with people who feel that way. Oh, I can't go into the ministry until God gives me this gift that I want. Oh, when God gives me the gift of healing, boy, I'll go out. Boy, God gives me this gift, man, I'm going to go out. When I feel these gifts that God gives me, because what's in it for me? That, that's the wrong attitude. And that's the attitude of these workers. That's the attitude of these laborers. The attitude of these laborers were, we got hired at 5.30, this guy got hired at 11. Are you serious? We're getting the same pay? What's in it for us? Come on, what is in it for us? Man, we, I want physical blessings. I want to be able to uh, have the nice, deep, dark hair uh, that Lee does at his age. I'm, I'm, younger, I'm, I'm younger than Lee. Look at my hair. It's all gray. And Lee has this dark, nice-looking hair, beard. He's in great shape. Man, I want to be like that, God. I can't go out and minister. I can't do that until I can stand up here and sing like Byron does. You know, right? We, we do this. Beware of us. See, we bargain with God. Well, God, if I was able to, and that's it. I can't minister because, God, you didn't give me this gift yet. Boy, you give me the gift of interpret, spiritual interpretation, man, I'll go out. Boy, God, you give me this. No, because God's given us gifts. When we start asking and trying to bargain and say, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, is basically we're saying, what's in it for me, God? I can't serve you. God knows what we need. You know, I often I was, uh, um, kind of thought to myself last night, we were watching a movie at home, and there's this older guy, this old kind of cowboy-looking guy, and he's probably like, in the, uh, I, I, I hate to say how old, but he's an older. And he pulls out this guitar, and he's strumming this guitar, and he's singing. And I'm thinking, man, I, I, I wish I could have played guitar. You know, I, I thought, man, I, I, I should have played guitar. And, and, but you know what? God gave me the gifts I need. I don't have the musical gifts. <laughs> All right? There's certain gifts I know I don't have. But God did give me other gifts. So I need to realize that because he's provided me the gifts he wants me to have. Each will be different. We're all going to be different. Some of us are going to come to know Christ when we're in our 20s. Some are going to come to know Christ maybe when we're, um, you know, when we're in our 30s. Some will come to know Christ when we're in our 50s. Some might not come to know Christ until later years. I will tell you this, moms and dads, for those of you who, who uh, want to know, the idea is that 80% of all decisions for Christ come before a child is 15 years of age. 
So if you get your child in the church on a regular basis, you're sharing the gospel with them on a regular basis, and you're asking them and developing the gospel with them. I mean, I mean teach that gospel with them. And they, make the, they, they, they accept Christ. That's great, because sometimes if they haven't made that decision, it gets harder and harder and harder the older we get somewhere. Each will be used to plant. Some will be used to harvest. Some will be used to water. Moses, man, he did not have the gift of talk, but Aaron did. But Moses had, uh, Moses had the gift of leadership. Aaron didn't. So God said, I will call you, Moses, to lead the children of Israel out of uh, the wilderness. But, 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 but God, I, I can't. Aaron will be your mouthpiece. And by the way, Joshua will be your fighter. He will be the physical brawn that you need to step into that promised land. Don't worry, Moses, you don't have to carry the shield and sword. I will bless Joshua, and he will be able to do that. See, that's, that's how God works. The apostles had various missions here. Now, but sometimes we get too busy also comparing. I have a picture here of the Palace de Concord. The French saw how great our revolution was against the English in 1776. And all of a sudden, the French people said, you know what? We want a revolution, too. We're going to overthrow our government. But they didn't have the same ideals that we did. When you try to compare the French Revolution to the American Revolution, it gets pretty bloody. No pun intended. The Palace de Concord, this is where they set up the guillotine. 40,000 people's heads were cut off. They cut so many people's heads off, they had to keep moving the guillotine because people were slipping on the blood. And I mean that in a serious way. Hey, I'm going to whoop boo. Oh, man. That's not like our revolution at all. We didn't execute those who, who supported the British. No. You know, that, and so our revolution had different ideals of what the French Revolution did. And which, by the way, had completely different ideals than the Russian Revolution or the Chinese Revolution. See, so we can't compare revolutions. The same way as believers, we can't compare ourselves to others. No, nope. look what happened. They worked the whole day. Remember? The guy who owned the vineyard, who's gone, he went out and chose laborers. Some he chose early, some who chose at three, some at six, some at nine, some at the eleventh hour. They came pay time. Bring everybody together. Everyone comes together. And all of a sudden he starts, he says, pay those men who came, who started last, pay them first. And all of a sudden they hand them a denarius. And the guys in the back who've been there like all day long are saying, whoa, Calvin just came at the 11th hour. He's getting a denarius? Well, maybe we're getting paid by the hour. Oh, this is going to be pretty good. Wow, this is really going to be pretty good. And then they found out, no, no, one denarius for one day's work. Whether that day was 10 hours, 5 hours, 3 hours, 1 hour, these last men have worked, only worked one hour, but you made them equal to us. So now those first, those first vineyard workers started to say, hey, 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 time out. That's not right. You're screwing me over. You're paying these guys the same thing. I, you, 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 pay me, you pay me, right? See, it's easy to get caught up comparing our walk to others. I've done that before. I've done that before. I'll be honest with you. I've compared my walk to others. All right, Lord, you called me in this ministry, and here I am. But, man, I'm, I'm watching this guy doing this. I'm watching this guy doing this. I'm seeing this guy over here. I'm seeing this guy over here. I'm seeing, and we, we start to get a little frustrated at times, maybe. Peter, well, and here's a prime example of that. Peter had just been forgiven by Jesus Christ. This is John 21. Remember, Peter denied John a couple chapters earlier. And now Jesus has Peter, and he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my sheep. Peter, do you really love me? Yes, Lord, I really love you. Feed my sheep. Oh, and by the way, Peter, let me tell you something. This is how you'll die for me someday. You'll be crucified for me. Now, here's Peter, the rock. <sighs> okay, but as soon as Jesus tells him that, what does Peter say? What about John? How? How's he going to get it? Oh, I want to know. That's really what he's saying. And when you read through that passage in John chapter 21, 18 through 21, you'll see that. As soon as Jesus tells Peter what's going to happen to him, but, but, but I want to know about John. Peter, Peter, I've just told you. But, 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 but why do you need to know about John, Peter? Why do you need to compare your life to John's life? I have other things in store for John. I have other things in store for Thomas, for Matthew, 
I have other things in store for them. They're all going to go out and work for me. See, we get caught up worried about others. We get caught up, you know, in the apples and oranges comparison. And then what happens is, when we get caught up worried about others, it's just like what Jesus said to Cain. Remember Genesis chapter 4? Gene, or I'm sorry, God knew Cain was grumbling. Boy, that stinking Abel, he's a snuffle. He's sucking up the people. His, his offering's better than my offering. He's evil. Man, he can't bench press what I can bench. <laughs> he can't slay what I can slay. He's not even near as good looking as that stinking little man of my man. Boom, he's kicking things, kicking things around, kicking the donkey beside him, kicking the whatever. And God says, hey, Cain, what's your problem, buddy? Beware of that because sin is crouching at your door. And what did Cain do? He ignored God and went out and took a rock and beat his brother to death. See, when we start comparing to others, now the pride is coming out. Now the jealousy is going to come out. Now the envy is coming out. And what happens is, it's from my own life. I'm not trying to step on your toes. My eyes go off of God and they go on myself. Now I'm no good for ministry anymore because I'm too caught up because of sin, of jealousy, pride, envy, that green ugh, just rolling through me. Now I'm angry. Now I'm getting bitter. Now I might get hard-hearted. Wow. See, our eyes focus on ourselves, not on God, and sin reigns. And that's exactly what's going to happen. With that. That's what God's afraid of. It's going to happen with these, these laborers. These laborers are going to do the same thing. Then what happens then? We become ungrateful. We become ungrateful. We need to go back and remember what the psalmist says. How awesome are your works? Come and see the great works of God. When I get caught up in comparison, I forget what God's given me. God's given me 59 years of life. God's given me the fact that I'm still walking on two legs. I still have two arms. God's given me the fact that, man, I have a beautiful wife who I've been married to now for almost 20, 28 years. I, I, I have these, these great kids. Now with grandkids, God's blessed me well. Man, I have a good job. I have friends. I have a church. You know, I've had a great parents. I live in a great country. Now I have great blessings. But see, when I get caught up and focus on myself, I forget the goodness of God. How we sing of the goodness of God. Think of the goodness of God. What he has given each of us. Focus on the blessings that God has given us. But again, we become envious. We become envious. In Galatians says, Bless, not your, bless us not become boastful, challenging, and envying one another, Paul says in Galatians. Don't get caught up in looking at what others have and look at what they do. Because sometimes what happens is, and you have to remember this, and I have to remember this, just because someone isn't serving God and just because they have what we take as riches, that does not mean God has put his stamp of approval on them. That does not mean that, oh, man, they must be doing something right with God. No, because life is what? Not fair. Life is not fair. And I know some of you in here, and I've, I've met with some of you guys. I know we, in our men's group we talk about it a good bit, and we'll talk about the fact that, man, why, why do we have this when we see that? Because life isn't fair because of sin. But that doesn't mean that the person who's living like the devil over there has God's stamp approval on their life. They might not have the eternal life that you do. They might not have the light of Jesus Christ in you the way you do. We have to look at that. Yeah. And what happens is, and I appreciate, when we focus on self, we get silent or unconcerned about sin, and we become compliant. This is why as believers, we need, and I appreciate, as soon as I walked in this morning, uh, Eric toward me. We were talking about this a little bit. And Eric said something really good. He said, you know what, brother? He said, we need to pray for those folks who did that because they are lost. And I agree. I agree. I don't know. I don't know who's on the Olympic committee. I don't know who the brainchild was that came up with this. But we need to be in prayer for them. And you know what Kyle said? He, 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 you know, he spun right off of that. When he came up and shared that prayer with us this morning, what did Kyle say? Hey, don't be afraid to talk about this. But, but we, need to be, we need to watch how we approach it. We can't say, man, I think all those people in the Olympics are going to hell. They're going to burn, burn, burn. We just turned the cashier off at Walmart. <laughs> Security, you know, they're going to haul us out of there. But when you say, you know what, do you think maybe, did you happen to see the Olympics? 
I think that kind of was really dishonorable toward God. That's a nice, easy statement. Kyle, thank you for bringing that up. And then that can work for the Lord. Because we need to love folks. And sometimes in the Christian community, we, we come off way too strong. We have to realize that everyone's God's child. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They're not God's child. Everyone's, everyone's created in God's image. He wants all to come to know Christ. Those who come to know Christ are God's child. But God loves each one of these folks. You know that? Because he demonstrated his love for us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for this person, this person, this person, and even this person right here. So let's not become compliant, but let's not be afraid to start conversations. And let's realize that's what God's called us to do. How can we do that? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on it. See, these laborers started to take their eyes off what they were doing and started to look at themselves. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says, keep your eyes on me. You know that I am God. I will do what's right. I'm not going to cheat you. I'm not going to shortchange you. I will do what is right in your for you. So warning number one, we saw, don't bargain. Number two, don't compare yourself. Know that God is good. He created us. He redeemed us, and he sustained us. And we end with this statement. I've shared this before the church a little bit. Uh, when I first, uh, my, my first job in the Navy, I was hanging out at Pearl Harbor a little bit. I loved that because I got to Pearl Harbor, and they didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. I knew what I was supposed to be doing. So they said, hey, keep yourself busy for two weeks. <laughs> I went out on an island. <laughs> yeah, of course I keep myself busy for two weeks, and I did. And all of a sudden, I got orders that you're supposed to report to Guam. Uh, and when I got to Guam, they said, hey, boy, you're a new guy. You're going to, you're going to sanitation disposal. Oh, that sounds pretty fun. All right, what are we going to do? <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah, because Guam was a garbage dump. We weren't allowed to dump water, uh, garbage in the ocean anymore because it affected the sharks. They ate cans and stuff. It wasn't healthy for their diet. So we had to bring it to Guam. So all the ships brought their garbage here. And the sea bees had to take care of it. Oh, is it horrible? First time I jumped off the truck, I, he said, well, my buddy of mine said, hey, watch your step. And I, Whoosh. oh, I'm like knee deep in this garbage. I felt like Luke Skywalker in the one show uh, where he's in the garbage thing and things are crawling behind you. And we had to put Vaseline on our noses and had this, we had to wear this red band because it smelled and there's flies and there's things I didn't even know existed, these bugs and stuff like this. But I'm a, Long story short, is I get out of there really quick. I'm always here for any duty that came down the pike. I don't care what it was. I don't care if I was scrubbing barnacles off the ship. You know, I was going to do it. So I had to get out of that stinking garbage dump. But he all of a sudden it hit me one time. And you know what? I was a member of the greatest armed forces the world ever saw. I was a member of the United States Navy. John Paul Jones and all these great naval sailors. John Wayne fighting sea bees. You know? Here I was, and I'm mad because I'm stuck in Guam in the garbage dump. But what I thought to see was, it was an honor, and I volunteered to serve the United States Navy. I volunteered to defend my nation from enemies foreign and domestic. And it was an honor to wear that uniform. And it's the same way with being a believer. When they received it, look what the, look what the vineyard workers did. They grumbled. Then they said, Oh, yeah, these guys only work an hour. We have borne the burden. Know what it says? They grumble. See, serving the Lord should not be a grumbling event. Serving the Lord should not be a burden. They actually came, to, they came looking for work. The vineyard owner came to them. They agreed on a price. Yeah, we'll work for Daenerys. We will do the work you ask us to do. But now they're grumbling. Ah, he screwed us over. Man, he took it to me. I had to do all this heavy lifting. Boy, did I get crushed. We do that as believers. I've done that as believers. I've done that. This parable really hit me because it made me look in the mirror. Like what James talked about. It's a privilege to worship and serve God. And it should be granted for what's called Christ's sake. Don't forsake assembling and encouraging. You know what it is, folks? The times when we think, man, and, and I've done this before too. No, oh, man, I gotta give up, I gotta go to church. You know, folks, believers in China, they don't get the opportunity to go to church. They go to church, they're arrested and killed. Remember the Soviet Union? I can remember my mom and dad when uh, we were up to Grace Brother many, many years ago. 
It's called Mugford First Brother at that time. And I remember I was taking boxes in. I'm sorry, taking Bibles in and taking cake mix boxes in. And you would open the cake mix box, take the cake mix out, and slide a Bible in it, and then seal it back up. And then we were sending those to Russia. Because the Russians were not allowed to have Bibles. And if you were caught with a Bible, you'd go to a gulag. It's a privilege to be able to serve God in that church. It's a privilege to be able to say, you know what? I can come sit and I can hear, I can see Tom. You know, I can come and see Sam. I can, I can come and see all my friends and sit here. Ken, I, I, we can be worshiping together here. See, that's a privilege. But what happens is God's more interested in why you do something than what. This hit me too. God wants to know why. Why am I a pastor? Am I a pastor so that I can get this, 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 this? Or am I a pastor because I feel God has called me in this room? What has God called you into? Why are you serving God? Are you that leader in the home because you want to be? I hope so, because God's called you to be that. Or do you feel you have to be? Whoa. So I shouldn't see my prayer life, my devotional, my church attending, my tithes, my ministry, my living the gospel as a burden. I should see that to say, you know what, I want to be in more prayer. I want to memorize John chapter 1, 14. That way I am. We have a group of men who are doing that right now. Why? Not so we can pat ourselves in the back because we know the word of God now. And if something would ever happen that we can't see the word anymore, maybe we lose our eyesight, we have the word of God in our mind. And we can share that gospel. I want to have my devotional time. I want to have my church attendance. I want to tithe. I want to have to be in ministry. See, we need to be motivated by want to than have to. Our ambition should be on pleasing God. And, and I tell you, if you're found in motivation right now, read the book of Romans. Read the book of Romans, what Paul says to the Romans. It's a privilege to honor God and to serve God. Now, the problem was the laborers saw their work as a burden, not from the goodness of God. They forgot that the vineyard owner came to them and said, hey, I will give you this if you work for me. See, we need to, we need to realize the fact that God came to each of us and said, if you accept my son, which is a gift I have paid for you, and I want you to work for me. We should have a desire, an inward desire, to please God. It's a spiritual calling, an abundant life, an eternal life with Christ. So what might you need to do? I don't know if you know where this statement came from. Here am I, send me. Anyone know what prophet said that? Prophet Isaiah. When God said, who shall I raise up? Who will send the word out to Israel? Who will be that prophet? Isaiah said, here I am, God, send me. Do we have that attitude? Or do we have the, oh, stinking man, I, oh, God, why the guy screwed over? This guy's more better than I am, man, alive. No, God, I want you to send me. I want to step out and do the work. I don't know what work God's called you to do. You know. You know what God's placed in your heart. We need workers. The vineyard is right. We need people to pick. Some of you have been picking in the vineyard for 20 years. Some of you have been picking in the vineyard for maybe 50 years. Some of you might be brand new pickers in the vineyard. Those of us who are older pickers, man, we should not be, we'll not be pointing the finger at any of the younger ones. Because we need all people to work in the vineyard. Why? What did Jesus end by saying? Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Well, God, why does my neighbor have that? Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own creation? You're right, God. Are you upset with me, or are you just envious? Because I'm good. Where is your heart? Remember, attitude of humility and service. That's what's important. And we'll end with this. We have a last song. Yeah, you want to go get jewel ready? You want to knock on the door or, or whatever? We ring the bell or we'll hit the alarm, whatever we do out there. I want to end with this verse as our praise team comes. It takes a lot to live a life that really honors God. We, um, Tori and Kyle got married uh, the other Saturday. And many of you know that. And uh, the service was probably one of the best services I've ever been able to participate in. My brother-in-law, um, 
started the service, we did a counseling, Ray uh, gave us a message, and then I was able to come in and, and, and finish at 12 o'clock. But the main thing was, Tori and Thompson, we want God everywhere in our marriage. We want God everywhere in our service. And I had different people come up to me and say, you know what, we never saw a wedding like that. A lot of people give God lip service, but they really don't work him the whole way through. I think we need to think about this. I have to think about this. As, as a pastor, I, and, and I, I pastor now for 14 years. I taught Sunday school for about five or six. And there's people who hurt me through that time. People you've invested hours with, no, weeks with, and all of a sudden they just walk away. And that happens. And sometimes you grumble a little bit. Sometimes you think, man, this guy, man, he preaches into a church of 25,000, doesn't even know people's names. He never even has to meet with a person individually because he drives around in a big fancy car and a big fancy house, you know. And then God says, what are you grumbling about? Did I not give you the goodness that you have? Have I not blessed you? Am I not giving you the gift of eternal life? Am I not there for you today? You're right, God. You don't know the first thing about that guy who has 25,000 people. Maybe he's not doing what I actually called him. The greatest privilege in life is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, not for our pleasure, but for his pleasure. Where do you get that, Pastor, right here? Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and mobile. By the way, he, he wrote this passage right after he said, death has no victory, death has no sting for believers. So this passage is written right for believers. And what's he say? Knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Whatever you do, do it with your whole heart. Don't grumble. Don't compare. Don't try to bargain. Say, you know what, Lord? You've called me to this ministry. And I will do it with my whole heart. So the praise team's going to come up, and they're going to sing. She's coming. She's coming? Okay. Well, um, okay. Praise team's still going to come up, and they're going to sing. Um, but as we end, think a little bit. What's God calling you to do? What's God calling you to do? And can we do it with our whole heart? I know here as a church, I'll share with you, God's calling some people into our team ministry. We have teens now who are forming a, a youth group, and we're trying to put together a team ministry for them. We're, our folks who were teaching our younger children Wednesday night are moving up to help teach our teens. So we need a, a, some, young, some teachers who will teach our Wednesday night kids. We need some folks who are willing to say, you know what? I would be glad to study a passage of scripture uh, work with a pastor a little bit, work with someone, and be able to help with a Bible study a little bit. We, we'd love to have that. Uh, right now, there's you know, Lauren and myself and Ralph kind of carry that burden, but we'd love to have some other people say, you know what, I would, I'd like to share what God has given to me. You know, what, where, where do you want to serve? Where are you willing to serve? That's what God's calling us to do, to be able to honor and serve him. All right. Shall we stand and we'll end with our last song?
close that I was thinking about the attitude we have in serving Christ. I happen to look up and see our bass player. And many of you might not know the story behind our bass player, but this guy never really played bass up before, in front of people before. And all of a sudden, he starts uh, getting involved, and he feels the Lord tugging on his heart. And he said, you know what? I'd like to put my, my ministry to, to, to work. And I can just see how over time, God has just blessed him and blessed him. And now he's moving with the guitar, and he's up and down. And he even sang a couple of times. So, but, but see, that's allowing God to work with you and having an attitude of saying, here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Now, I don't grumble. Don't compare with somebody else. Don't try to bargain with God. Here I am, Lord. I'm happy for the 11th hour work, or I'm happy for the 5.30 in the morning work. But here I am, because it's an honor to serve you and live a life for you today. Because the world needs believers who are on fire. Let's take a look at the Olympics, right? <laughs> Father, I thank you for the folks in this church and how they just bless, bless each other. And boy, they just blessed me. Lord, Jolene needed help, and there were ladies who rose to the occasion. There's ladies who are raised, raised, who are rising to the occasion tomorrow to go help her. You know, Doug was in rough shape, and man, there's brothers who right away went into prayer for him, texted him, encouraged him. Lord, help us to be that type of a church where we, it's not about us. It's about you, and it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, pleasure to go into prayer for you, to pray for a brother or sister who needs you. It's a prayer to encourage them in a text or to maybe to bring them a little, uh, I don't know, a little piece of pie to the, the church or stop by their house and say, hey, here I'm thinking about you. Help us to do that. Help us to encourage and build each other up. Help us to have the zeal to take the gospel to someone. Help us to have the ability and the courage, as Kyle challenged us in our prayer, to start a small conversation and allow you to take it. We don't have to kick the door in with theology and pound Romans down someone's throat. Allow you to take the conversation. Father, I thank you, and I just pray you'll bless us and keep us. Help us now as we uh, honor and serve you, and we pray lift you up, Lord, and declare you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And may we bless you with our attitudes, our hearts, and our works. In the name of our risen Jesus, our name of our Savior Jesus Christ, we pray and thank you, Lord. Amen. God bless you and have a great weekend. There is cake. There is cake, so you cannot leave without.